The Lord be with you. I hope you'll join me in a Bible as we look together at Romans chapter 13, verses 1 to 7. 1 to 7. Today we're looking at something that has proven to be a hotly contested issue among Christians. And that is the proper relationship between the church and the state. The church and the state. We've been talking about the individual Christian's role in the world as a citizen of a particular state. We have talked about the state's unique authority to use force and even violence if necessary. We saw how that is a necessary evil in the midst of, of a fallen world. And today we're thinking specifically about what is to be the proper relationship, the right relationship between the church the institution established by God under the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and the state also established by God to exert his rule and governance and sovereignty in the world. Since I'm a Baptist, you probably won't be surprised to hear that I believe the Bible teaches that a free church and a free state is the ideal arrangement, the right and proper relationship between church and state. But so often, as Americans, we can just take that relationship for granted. And so we want to bear down on what is right about that arrangement and look at some of the pitfalls that can accompany working out this relationship between church and state. And what I hope to show you above all is that we as the church, we as Christians in the midst of this world and, and whatever state we find ourselves are to pay up. We are to pay up. We are to pay whatever we owe to the state without bowing down to the state. It's a very, very delicate dance that we have to negotiate and navigate. But that's what we're called to do. Pay up without bowing down. So let's read together verses 1 to 7. Our focus will be verses 6 to 7, but to get the whole context, let's begin at verse 1. Paul says, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong. Do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right, and you will be commended. For the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes, for the authorities are God's servants, who give their full time to governing. Give to everyone what you owe them. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Paul, in this section of his letter to the church in Rome, is laying out what it looks like for Christians to apply the gospel to their daily lives. And specifically here, how do we apply the gospel to our relationship in the state, and in, in whatever state we find ourselves, to civil authorities? And Paul establishes, first, that all authorities, all civil authorities, all authority has been established by God, the good, the bad, and the ugly. All of it has been established by God, and God works through all of them without necessarily affirming any one of them or blessing any one of them. He works in and through them to promote human flourishing and to restrain evil. And he has given the sword, symbolizing the power to use force and violence to restrain evil to the state. And Paul says that the Christians, Christians are to be the very best of citizens, the very best of citizens. Wherever we find ourselves, we are to submit. Our, our posture and our attitude is to be one of respect 
and submission to the governing authorities, insofar as we can. When the authorities begin to lay burdens upon our conscience, when the authorities demand that we do something that is contrary to God's word, when they ask us to compromise our loyalty to Christ, well then and only then does the Christian consider insurrection or rebellion or civil disobedience. And Paul says that we are to do this, we are to submit, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. In other words, don't do it just because you're afraid you might get punished. Don't do it just because you're afraid that someone's going to lower the boom on you. Do it because your conscience knows it is good and right to show reverence and respect and submission to the authorities that God has established. And he says, this is why you pay taxes. Because these authorities are God's servants. They are carrying out God's purposes in the world, whether they know they are or not. They are. And they give their time to governing, so pay taxes. Pay them for what they do. If you need to give them respect or honor, do so. But don't bow down to them. Don't see them as more than what they really are. So, a free church and a free state. That's our current arrangement, uh, as established by the Constitution of the United States. And as Americans, we can probably take that for granted. How did we get to that point? And I, I think it's important to know why different groups of Christians have come to different conclusion, different conclusions about that arrangement. They have thought that it was actually better for church and state to be in a partnership, to be in alignment, for there to be a state church. Why did they think that? Well, they had reasons for doing that. It's not just because they were crazy. We can't just dismiss them. We need to know why they established those arrangements, and we need to know why the United States was founded on different principles, and why, as Baptists, we hold and support different principles. The partnership between church and state really goes back to Constantine, the Roman Emperor Constantine, in the fourth century when he professed to become a Christian. Prior to that, Christians had assembled separately from the governing authorities. They were separated and spread out across the Roman Empire, and they did their best to be good Roman citizens, even in the face of severe persecution. But it was very rare for a magistrate, for a governor, for a civil authority to be a Christian until Constantine professed to be a Christian. And we won't get into his motivations for that, whether it was sincere or not. He professed to be a Christian. And so from that time onward, Christians have had to wrestle with what happens when a Christian becomes a king or a queen or a president, or a governor. What happens then? And this is where you have different perspectives on this issue coming out. So, for example, historically, the Roman Catholic Church has said that the church is to be over the state. The church is to be over the state. Consider the fact that the Vatican is not only the seat of the Roman Catholic Church, it's also a state this is why nations send ambassadors to meet with the Pope and to meet with his secretaries. It's a state. And historically, the Roman Catholic Church sought to rule over civil authorities, to exert church teaching over civil authorities. Another version of that is to put the state over the church. So, for example, in the Church of England, Queen Elizabeth is the head of the Church of England. And she has authority over the Church of England. Now, there are distinctions. She can't just do anything. She's not to get involved in, in consecrating bishops. She appoints, but she doesn't consecrate. She's not to get involved in punishing heresy. But there is this partnership. And you see the same thing in Scandinavia, where there are state churches and people pay taxes to support the state church. And then you see other versions where one particular denomination is maybe not the state church, but it's certainly privileged above and beyond other denominations. 
a certain denomination. And, and so the state is, has a vested interest in that denomination. And the denomination looks to the state for help in resolving their disputes or in working out their problems and punishing wrongdoing or heresy or doctrinal error. And then we have the separation of church and state, where church and state are two separate and distinct, essentially distinct entities, both established by God, but essentially distinct. That's the landscape. Now, why would anyone think that it's a good idea to have a state church? Why would anyone think it's a good idea for the state to take orders from the church or vice versa? Okay. Well, for one thing, the biblical support for this comes from the Old Testament, where in Israel you have, for example, David being both king of Israel and having authority over the priests. He can tell them where to go, where to stay, what to do with the Ark of the Covenant, what to do with the tabernacle, the, the meeting place between God and his people. And so you see this, this theocracy, a, a government that is a religious government beholden to a certain religion. But when you move to the New Testament, you don't see that being carried forward. To use Jesus' illustration, it's like pouring new wine into old wineskins. Those are old wineskins. That's, that's a, a temporary, unique, preparatory phase in God's overall plan of salvation. God had a purpose for Israel as both a people group and a nation state. And he supplied a certain government for them. But that government is not to serve as a model going forward. You just don't see this in the New Testament. What you see in the New Testament is the separation of church and state. You don't see the church trying to lobby or maneuver the state to do something. And you don't see the state trying to force the church to be something. There's separation. A free church and a free state. We believe that is the Christian ideal. But there's another reason why the idea of a state church is appealing to people. And it's because the power of the state has always had a a kind of seductive appeal to Christians. Because the state has the power to use force. And so many Christians, for the best of reasons and out of the best of intentions, have said, all truth is God's truth. We need to make this world more Christian. And so if we have the power of the state, why shouldn't we leverage that? Why shouldn't we use that to make the world a better place? Right? But sadly, a lot of harm, deadly harm, has come from the partnership between church and state when the church tries to use the state to get its means or when the state tries to control the church to enforce a certain version of the church that it finds more amenable. And this, you can see this in the world right now, all over the world. You can see it in China where the state is trying to control the church and they have certain churches that are authorized and and churches that are not, right? So you see this all over the world. And when you look back over the course of history, you can see the harm that's come from this because What the Bible shows is that true and living faith in God through the Lord Jesus Christ cannot be coerced. It cannot be forced. And when anyone tries to force it, when anyone tries to manipulate it, it leads to false conversions. It it, it leads to people who, who say yes to Jesus just because they're afraid of the sword. They're afraid of consequences. And, and that's not true in living faith. That's not a free church and a free state. But neither should the church expect the state to carry out her mission. And so we need to understand three very important principles that distinguish the church from the state. The first is the origin. Both the church and the state derive their existence from God. It's just that Government, civil authorities, are derived from God's common grace. God's common grace. It's a common gift to humanity. Good government 
is a common grace from God. It isn't dependent upon the revelation of Scripture. It's not dependent upon the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's available to the world. But the church is established by special grace. Special grace. The church is established by the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the head of the church. The church answers to him, ultimately. And so both expressions of God's grace, both expressions of of God's sovereignty and governance in the world, both used by God, but they have a different origin in God and in God's sovereign purposes. They also have a different purpose. The purpose of the state, as we've seen, is to promote human flourishing, to promote what is right, what is just, what is true, what what is for the common good, and to restrain what is wrong, what is unrighteous, what is unjust, what is evil. That's what the state is doing. And the state has to do that whether or not people are Christians. Because we're in a fallen world and there's always going to be a certain measure of evil. We're never going to live in a utopia in this life. The church, on the other hand, is designed by God to serve the purposes of his kingdom on earth. Building his kingdom under the lordship of Jesus Christ. And as Jesus says in John 8, 18, 36, he says to Pilate, he's on trial, he says, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. The Lord Jesus exercises a sovereignty that goes beyond what the human eye can see. And so its purpose is a spiritual purpose. And then the third principle that distinguishes church from state is the power that they wield, the power that they wield. The state can wield the sword and is supposed to wield the sword. The state is supposed to use force against evil. It has to. There's no other way to deal with that kind of evil. But the church doesn't rely on coercive force. The church uses the power of persuasion, the power of preaching the gospel, of holding out the good news that in Christ God has reconciled sinners to himself. That's what we rely on. So different origin, different purpose, and different power. Those distinguish the church and the state. But when they get mixed up and confused, you start getting people who don't really know what it means to be a Christian. And it's it's very important that, that we be use caution, that we use caution when it comes to the word Christian, because technically speaking, we can't make anything Christian. We can't make anybody Christian. We can't make a nation Christian. God and God alone makes someone Christian. God and God alone makes something Christian. Because how does someone become a Christian? By being born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus says to Nicodemus, John 3, unless you are born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you are born again, unless God has brought about a supernatural transformation in you, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And so what the church longs for and works for is the regeneration of individuals. And we can't get sidetracked, and and so many churches get sidetracked and and fall prey to, to good things, but things that distract from her primary mission, which is to preach the gospel. And true and permanent change in the world only happens when it is rooted in the regeneration of the individual. This is how God changes the world, one heart at a time, one life at a time. But now what are the pitfalls here? When we say we we pay up, to the governing authorities, the civil authorities, but we we don't bow down. The church is ever in danger of bowing down to civil authorities. And it all comes back to that seductive power, that seductive draw of what the state can offer, of force. And so different Christians from different sides of the political spectrum come at this from different angles. But it's basically the same approach. On the left, you've got people who are saying that the church has got to speak up about systemic racism. The church has got to speak up about climate change. 
The church has got to speak up about income inequality. On the right, you've got people saying, we've got to speak up for the unborn. We've got to lobby against abortion. We've got to legislate about human sexuality. And, and each side is coming that, at this from a, a different side, a different angle, different perspective, but it's the same thing. They're looking to the state, looking to the state, and sometimes, sadly, bowing down to the state and thinking that the state can bring the kingdom of God. And the reality is that it can't. Pay up, pay taxes, pay respect, pay honor, pay what you owe. We owe governing authorities for the good that they do in the world, and we are thankful. We are so thankful for those who devote their time, their energy, their lives to governing well. To governing well. And the church does have a vested interest in speaking out when governments are corrupt and speaking out when, when governments are not upholding principles of righteousness and truth. We do speak up. But don't think that God needs the government to accomplish his purposes in the world. He has, he has established the church to do that. Now, one other very important distinction we need to make is that there's a distinction between what you do as an individual Christian and what we do as a church, as an organization. Here's what I mean. You as an individual Christian, if you have been born again by the Holy Spirit, if you have been purchased by the shed blood of Jesus, you have a responsibility, you have a call to live out that faith in the world. And so be on the lookout for how you can do that, how you can partner with parachurch organizations, with, with fellow Christians, to advocate to, for, for righteousness and for truth, to work for the well-being of the common good. That's good and right. And when churches have really preached the gospel, what you see is, is that Christians are going out and establishing schools and hospitals. They're, they're doing all kinds of good. They're abolishing slavery. They're bringing about the end of segregation. They're doing a lot of good, but it's vitally important that the church, as the church, as an organization, maintains a laser focus on what Jesus has called us to do. And you see this throughout the New Testament. When the Apostle Paul, for example, is, is traveling about the Mediterranean, you will never find him trying to lobby a Roman official for better policy. What he wants is for the Romans to allow him to freely preach the gospel. He doesn't say, now Festus, now Felix, now Herod, I, I, I need to talk to you about your welfare system. I need to, I need to talk to you about, about these inequalities. I need to talk to you about that person you put to death last week. He doesn't go there. He doesn't go there. Neither does he advocate for churches when he's writing to specific churches, the church in Corinth, the church in Ephesus. He doesn't say, now, by the way, when you gather, I want you to talk about the legislation that you're going to lobby for. Now, by the way, make sure you schedule an appointment with the Roman governor or the, the procurator or whoever it is in, in your province. Be sure and go meet with him to, to lobby for certain things. No, he wants the church to be the church. He wants the church to focus on preaching the gospel, on making disciples, because that's where real change happens. And as people are regenerated, as they are born again by the power of the Holy Spirit, and then they go out into the world, this is where real change happens. May it happen in your life and in my life. May we bear witness to what God has done in our lives. May we be salt. May we be light. But also, may we not confuse what God has clearly established as distinct. May we pay up what we owe. Respect, honor, taxes, revenue. Without bowing down. Without expecting government to do what it cannot do. And this is where we have to acknowledge that we all need to repent here. Because we know the news, we know the headlines are dominated by politics. Dominated by policy discussions. 
and they're not bad, they're not wrong, but so often we as Christians can get so invested in a particular candidate, in a particular cause, and we think that somehow that is fulfilling our Christian duty in the world. Oh, trust me, I'm working to make the world a better place because I voted for this person. And I'm concerned that maybe we think that we've raised our children well if our children vote the right way. No, use your Christian judgment, use wisdom, exercise your conscience, vote however the Lord leads you to vote, be a good upstanding citizen, do right, pray for kings and pray for all those in authority, but never forget the purpose of the church, that the church is not of this world, the church is in the world, that the church is God's means for calling out his people and redeeming his people. We've got to stay focused. We've got to stay focused. As we go to the Lord's Prayer. Dear Lord, we are surrounded by signs of your goodness and your grace. Forgive us for taking good government for granted. Forgive us for when we take our privileges in this nation for granted. We are so thankful to all those who commit their lives to serving our nation. We are so thankful to those who have gone before us, who have spilled their blood, who have advocated, who have worked, who have sacrificed so that we can worship freely. We thank you for that, Lord. But I also pray that you would show us our idolatry, the idolatry of politics, the idolatry of, of, of acting like and, and working as though government can bring your kingdom to earth. We confess, Lord, it can't. You and you alone can. And you have called your church to proclaim that message, to point everyone, everyone, across every nationality, across every language, everyone, to point them all to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. May we look to Jesus as Savior and Lord. May we remain laser focused on what you have called us to do. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So glad you could join us. Hope you have a wonderful week. I hope to see you again next Wednesday.